What is up, everybody? It's Matt Johnson. We are back with another episode of Real Estate Uncensored. This is the place where you get actionable ideas, insight, and inspiration to turn your real estate career into a life of freedom. Uh, and we have a guest here with us that's done just that. So we're excited to talk to him because he's built essentially a no complications business. Uh, that was one of the, the bits of things that stuck out to me about my first conversation with him and why I wanted to bring him on the show for you guys is if you are looking to build a, a lifestyle where you can really build whatever type of real estate business that you want, especially if you want to end up turning that real estate business into something that fuels long-term wealth. Uh, that's what we're going to talk about with our guest and the style of business that he's built and how he's turned that into investments and all kinds of fun stuff. So anyway, that being said, I'm your certified Greg Wrangler for today. Hi. Here to make sure that Greg doesn't uh, interfere with uh, with a great interview with our guest. Uh, he is the junior grandmaster. He's uh, he's in the co-pilot seat where he so belongs. Greg Mataniel. Greg, what's up today? Johnson's good to be here. Michael, you're going to make it rain. We're not going to make you touch the computer. We're not going to make you do that. So we're, we're, we're that's our safe zone. That's our safe word. We say computer, we stop. Um, but uh, that's an inside joke between the three of us. But anyway, I, we find it funny. <laughs> um, dude, I had such an awesome time, dude. I went out to lunch today with a guy named Mark, uh, his team member Kevin, and the new hire Jake. They took me out to La Costa, which uh, any of you Bay Area guys, East Bay, know it. It's a great little Mexican place. So I got to go out there. I got to give them a lot of information and ideas to how how to actually Matt to actually how to systematize their business. Ironic enough, I know. I but know. it's a seventeen letter word for you, but I yeah. yeah. I got it. Yeah, it's like, oops, it, I got my, yeah, anyways, but anyways, I was super pumped, honored to be out there with him. I'm excited to be here with Michael. So, dude, Michael, man, welcome, dude. It's so awesome to have you here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> we appreciate like, it. Uh, and it's, <laughs> it's funny. So we posted uh, that we we're bringing you on the show today, and even Greg Harrelson mentioned uh, that, you, that you're a rock star. I know you guys go uh, probably back to the the Mike Ferry days, but um, so let's talk about that on the cold call prospecting side a little bit, because one of the things that jumped out to me in our first conversation was you mentioned something about versatility, and when you're on with the phone with somebody, not really letting on, and them not being able to tell what your personality type is, they should see it almost as a reflection of what they are. So how do you how do you think about that and how do you pull that off on a practical level when you're calling all these different types of people every day? There's nothing more important when you're trying to persuade somebody to do anything than your level of versatility. If you believe that there are four, four different personality styles, the amiable, the uh, driver, the expressive, the analytic, None of those really make any difference. All that matters is that when you're talking to someone that needs your help, uh, if they need your help, that they believe that that you're like them. If they don't believe that, I don't great. I don't care how high your skill levels are. Um, I don't care how great a closer you are, how great your scripts are. Um, they're probably going to hang up the phone on you. Mm. The versatility is the most important thing when you're trying try to help somebody get what they want in the time they want. Gotcha. That's something that I learned a long time ago. My my father, Michael, uh, has been in the business for 45 years, and he was old Mike Ferry guy. He was with uh, Howard Britton with Star Power, and right. it was all and it was what we would get, get browbeat into us day in and day out. It was all about be like the other person. You know, it doesn't matter if it's not your personality, but be like them to gain the trust so that you can gain the credibility and then get the business. And I was talking with a young gal who's 21 today, Courtney, and I was teaching her that script and that, that concept. And she, she's like, oh, my gosh, I never thought about it that way. But it's I mean, it's, it is the kind of the crux of, you know, how to get, gain people's trust is to make them feel that you're the same. Right. Well, you know, I'm not sure if it's really that you're the same. They need to feel comfortable that whoever is they're, they're speaking with, whoever's listening to them accepts them and isn't judging them, makes them feel important because everybody, if you buy into the Earl Nightingale phrase, everybody on the top of their forehead is wearing a, you know, those four words make me feel important. Mm -hmm. If you make them feel important and they feel heard, then any preconceptions they might have about you, how you look, how you speak, the pace of your tone, how you're sitting, that will, for the most part, uh, they'll put that aside to give you a chance because you're showing a lot of respect to them. And uh, if you show a lot of respect to people, it doesn't mean you have to be a wuss. That's not what I'm talking about, but you're being polite, you're being respectful, and you're showing you're very serious about helping them, and they feel empowered by you. There's very few people that won't at least initially give you a chance. At least that's been my experience. 
Interesting. So if you make them feel important, you know, for the for maybe a new agent that's watching this right now, what would be a, a, a layman's a, a scenario that someone could kind of wrap their brain around? So if I, if you, I mean, what, how would you explain this to a new agent? You know, very very basic. The easiest way and the crux of selling to make somebody feel important is to ask questions. Mm -hmm. If you're on a date with a girl, you want to make her feel great. You ask questions about herself. Mm -hmm. You know. The, I'll, I'll give you an example. So the best people at this, of course, most of the time are politicians. Uh, whether you agree with them or not, the Bill Clintons, the Barack Obamas, the Ronald Reagans, yep. um, these people were absolute masters of making that person, whoever they're speaking to at the moment, feel like they're the center of the universe. And if that person feels like they're the center of the whole universe and that they're important, they will give you um, – your time, they'll give you your trust, and eventually they'll give you your money, their money. Mm -hmm. You, uh, I, I, I was, I preach about the Ford script, you know, family, occupation, recreation, and dreams, and continually asking about the other individual. And like you said, going on a date, you know, you go on a date and you just talk constantly about them and be going three deep or five deep with them, always being in a state of curiosity. You, do you find that the law of reciprocity will then eventually come back? And they'll be like, well, what about you? Or they'll want to ask about more about you because you've you put investing into them. I, I'm going to say something that's going to be probably off kilter. And most people probably won't, won't accept what I'm going to say. But I actually believe this to be true. Uh, for the most part, people really don't care about you. They, they don't. care about themselves. And it doesn't mean they're selfish. It just means that most people have their own self-interest. Mm -hmm. And they want what they want. When you speak about yourself and you speak about your accomplishments and your this and your that, within five seconds, automatically somebody's turning you off. Yeah. However, if you say and really mean it, or at least pretend like you mean it, and say, gosh, tell me more about yourself. Mm -hmm. Where are you from? Where, how did you get there? Tell me about your parents. Tell me about how did you decide to pick this, this um, profession? Where are you moving to? Why are you moving there? And you start asking them all these questions. Now, you want to be nice about it you want to seem interested you don't want to come off like a you know commandant in, in a prison cell <laughs> um which early, which early in my career because of my personality style initially that's the way i would come off and and it drove mm -hmm. a lot of people away um for the small percentage of drivers i was dealing with they loved it but, but a lot of people didn't like it and so i had to learn to really come up with a higher source of a uh, sense of versatility because i naturally ask a lot of questions mm -hmm. And I find other people more interesting than myself, especially in a selling situation. So that's really what it's about. That's, that's really all it's about. It really you know, is. I know, I know it sounds too simplistic, but if somebody is a millennial and they're getting in the business or even you know a veteran, you're not getting what you want, you've really got to take all the focus off yourself and start putting it on the other person and what their needs are and forget about yours. Mm-hmm. Then one of the things that I talk about a lot is that, you know, we let you, and I always preach it in the, the same way that you, you just said it. People don't care about you until they know that you care about them. And Absolutely. once, once yeah. you become relevant to them, then right. they'll start giving, you know, half a shit about you. No and question it, about it's, it. It's a stair step, you know, slow process. You're not going to go from the first date to getting married. It's just not going to happen. You know, you need well, to build that trust. Yeah. I mean, you can pay for that, but it doesn't mean last for a <laughs> You can't. Yeah. Set me up for oh, God's no. sakes. Yeah. Oh my God, that's funny. All right, well, let's take a step back because we we dive right <laughs> into the tactical stuff real quick. So, Michael, why don't you share real quick, um, kind of where you're based at, what your specialty is, you know, what, who the types of clients that you really enjoy working with, and how long you've been doing that. Um, I've been in the business now to be 27 years in June. Uh, I'm based in the San Francisco Bay Area. I live in an area called Marin County, California, which is um, north of the Golden Gate Bridge. But I work. Uh, myself personally, we were within an hour in any direction um, from Marin County, whether it's east or west or south. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's what I do. Cool. And uh, one of the reasons that we were turned on to you is that Michael Higdon, who I've interviewed in the past before, uh, mentioned that he got some very key things uh, from a presentation that you did about how to get into probate leads. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But that's definitely not the only thing that, about you that kind of caught my my ear. So when we were chatting on the phone the other day, you mentioned that you've never done any personal advertising. So I'd like to ask you yeah. to elaborate a little bit on that and, and what you mean, what you consider personal advertising and why you've never branched out into that area. Well, it, 
I'm going to say something again. This might rub people the wrong way, but there's an old adage that if you are able to generate, you don't have to tolerate. And what that means twofold is that number one, if you are willing to get on the phone and prospect for an hour, two hours, three hours, four hours a day, you're going to be able to self-generate all the business you want. What goes with that is that because you're able to self-generate, and if you know how to price property properly, mm. and you can take two, five, 10, 12 listings a month, um, then you don't have to do any advertising because first of all, you're going to have all the other agents trying to sell your listings for you. And I, I, I double in about 30% of all of my own listings also. So, you know, it, nice. it really all starts with being able to generate business. If you're not willing to generate your own business, then you're going to have to have an advertising budget. And quite frankly, I'm only in this business for one thing besides helping other people get what they want. And that's to be highly, highly profitable. Because if you're not highly profitable, you really should get a regular job because this is a very, very tough business if you're not highly profitable. Hmm. And de define highly profitable for us real quick in terms of, I mean, are you shooting for like 65, 70% out of your, out of your GCI? Is that, is that how you measure it? Do you measure it some other way? Yeah, I think that, that for most cases, not everybody, because everybody has different motivations, but I run a very, very, um, uh, you know, I think a very clean operation, a very lean operation, uh, because it's all customer centric. Mm -hmm. So I have myself and I have two full-time assistants. Um, and they basically run everything that I bring in. So there's no need for an advertising budget. There's no need for any of that stuff because, again, my listings usually sell within the first one to seven days, either at or over the asking price. It's not because I'm anything more than I, I, I'm, I'm doing my best to tell the client the truth to help them get what they want the time they want and um, maximize profits for them. So would you take the advertising money that most people would spend on where I spent some time with some guys and they're spending, you know, nearly six grand a month on, uh, you know, a, a large uh, lead provider. Would you take that money and invest it back into staff bonuses or just hiring another additional person? Or would you just stay within your margins and not even attempt to do that? That goes right in my pocket. Where else is it going to go? <laughs> I mean, no, I, I, all, all kidding aside, honestly, if, if you're not, you have to be very clear from the outset that, at least for me, this, this business is a means to an end. I've been doing this means to an end for a long, long time. But again, from, from day one, it was pounded in, into my head that you really should not be running more than about 25 to 35% uh, expenses. Unless, you know, I, I have a very dear friend up, uh, up in Reading that, Great agent, Josh Barker, who if you haven't interviewed, you should. He's an absolute phenomenal guy and a great, runs a great business. Yeah. He's running, he's running a company. I think he runs about 50%. That's normal. He's doing a great job. He's making a great profit. But if you're, if you're running a, a small, lean boutique company like mine, if you're running more than 25 to 30%, something's wrong somewhere. It means you're probably not willing to put in the time to prospect to get the business you need. And you're also probably not running a highly effective system oriented business. You're probably in a, have, you're running some inefficiency somewhere that can easy, probably easily be remedied. Yeah. Mm. 100% agree. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, basically what you're doing, like you said, Michael, is you're substituting, you're trying to pay for not having to prospect, but you're also trying to substitute maybe dropping the ball a little bit on the client service to where you're not getting the referrals that you probably should get. And then you're right. trying to substitute lead generation to fill the top of the bucket faster than you can mm. lose them out the bottom. Um, so let's talk about that for a second in terms of, uh, you know, relating the past clients, making sure their, their experience while they're with you is amazing because you're obviously you're, you're one person, you've got two assistants. So on the client care side of things, do you have somebody that has like sole responsibility for kind of handling and being a backup communications point person? Does everything run through you? Um, are you just stepping in at certain times of the transaction? Like how do you make them feel unbelievably cared for to the point where they want to refer you without you having to work 24 hours a day? Cause I know you've got a family, you've got a lot of other stuff going on. Well, it, it all comes down to how you're running your systems and how you're presenting yourself. When I meet a client for the first time or I talk to them on the phone, cause a lot of my clients actually physically never meet probably 50% of my clients. I never actually physically meet. Good um, Lord. Really? At, at least 50%, maybe my, maybe up to 60%. And I'll share with you why in a moment. But the main thing I, I share with them is that, if you go to a doctor's office uh, or an attorney's office and the doctor is running around answering the phone and, you know, 
stamping mill and uh, you know taking x-rays i don't know about you but i would run out of that office as, as soon as i could <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know very very fast um that doctor is to do one thing and one thing only once his staff has come in and has helped pre-qualify that person and got them comfortable and not diagnose, but at least try to find out what they're there for. The doctor then comes in and with laser expertise says, this is what I see the problem is. This is how we're going to solve it. Solve it. Uh, here are your one or two or three options. Pick one and then let's do it. Hmm. That's it. That's what I do 10 to 12 hours a day, five and a half days a week. Um, I prospect for, for new business and uh, around my listings to sell them four hours every day. I go on listing presentations every day. I uh, negotiate contracts every day. That is my job. Everything else is support that is done by my staff. That's it. I have a very, very simple job. Yeah, and I'm very you're a clear about my, well, mm -hmm. I, I'm not calling myself a master. What I'm trying to say is that when the client understands that all I'm doing is once they sign that listing, prospecting to get their property sold, going by my plan of action to get it sold, then negotiating a contract, and that's all I do 10 to 12 hours a day, which is why I can get back to them in a very timely, quick, and efficient manner, and my staff is there if for whatever reason I'm on the phone or in a meeting, um, then they're very happy with that. Because I pride our, you know, we really pride ourselves in being, them, being there for them uh, minimum eight hours a day, five to seven days a week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very similar to the model that you run, Greg. Yeah, it's exactly right. I mean, I, I don't write any of my own contracts. I don't do any yeah. of that stuff. I mean, that's yeah. all done for me. I call my team lead. I'm like, here are the terms. Here's the price. Here's the emails. Go. That's she it. will write it, docusign it, get it back, write the email on my behalf, send it to the other agent. And I negotiate the, the actual contract. I, re re I negotiate any kind of terms and a request for repairs. And then the rest of the team takes it through the rest of the, uh, to the rest of the transaction, the transaction, unless I have to step in just like you do. Right. I, I haven't run a CMA 15 years. <laughs> I, wouldn't even, I, I wouldn't even know. That'd be like asking a doctor, would you go ahead and take the x-ray? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it, it's a, absurd. Mm -hmm. I know exactly what I, what I need to do every day. I know what I'm good at. And what I'm what I'm paid to do, I'm not paid to do all those other things. Yep. It's, 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 as soon as agents understand that the separation of church and state, and they can actually step away and stop doing things they're not the best at, their business is going to flourish, and we're going to allow other people to do what they're best at. Like about, for me to do follow up calls through my database, it is literally nap time. I'm like five. <laughs> And I'm done. Five calls in, and I, it's nap time. I'm done. Yeah, God, yeah. God forbid anyone try to have a personal conversation with you about what's going on in their life, Greg. <laughs> I'll talk to you, don't I? <laughs> Snoozeville. So, oh, oh, he's had a baby. Oh, God, he had another uh, one of those. God, again? Come on. Uh -huh. I, thought we, I thought we got the snip. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> well, I'm curious, Michael, because we, when we talked, uh, you mentioned that you do spend a lot of time with your past, you know, past clients and Sphere and stuff like that, but you are obviously a very – heavy prospectors. So share with the audience, like, why are you not like Greg? So how can you communicate with your, your sphere and your past <laughs> clients and stuff like that, even though you would rather be on the phone or maybe you, if it's like, how do you look at it mentally so that you're not having that same mentality that Greg has and looking at his, uh, his oh, database? God. <laughs> well, maybe I can learn from Greg because my, my sphere is yes. the lifeblood is the lifeblood of my business. So I have, for example, um, about 400 probate and estate attorneys in there. I have another, say, 500 past clients in there. It's a lot of my past clients. They live out of town. It's a one-time shot. It's either an estate or a probate or a trust or something. So I'm probably not going to get more business from them in the future. So the real annuity is going to be that attorney or fiduciary or trust officer or something like that. And those people, I, I speak to them all the time because they're constantly giving me business. So it's very important that I keep in contact with them. It really is important. And I, I, that's something I'm going to try to start building is building those attorneys. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that you treat these past clients and these referral sources like, or do, you, do you treat them kind of like celebrities or superstars? Like you get, you dote on them a little bit. You make them feel like they're the best of the best. So they, well, you're always top well, of mind. Well, regular civilians, yes. Um, but when, you're, when it comes to talking to attorneys and fiduciaries, you have to really be very, very fast and efficient with them because, A, they may or may not want to hear from you. 
B, they may be juggling 14 different things when you're calling. <clears throat> so when I call them, the first thing I always say is, you know, I, I'm, oh, I know you're busy. <clears throat> I know you're swamped. We spoke back in January and you said you might have something in May. I'm just checking to see if I can be of service to you right now. And they'll like say that. yes or no. If they say no, I'll say, have a wonderful week. Talk to you in a few months. Take care. And that's it. The whole thing is no more than 10 to 15 seconds. So they know when I call that I'm not going to waste their time. I'm not going to say, how are you? Let's talk about golf. <laughs> <laughs> right? Or, hey, can I tell you about how great I am? I, I took a listing this week. I mean, give me a break. <laughs> it's, I, it's, I know you're busy. I know you're swamped. I know you're a busy bee. Just checking. You thought there might be something coming up. And I'm just checking to see if I can be of service to you in any way, shape, or form. And then I let them tell me yes or no. So, Michael, you're basically, you and I are in the same boat. Matt Matt was trying to pit you against me, but you and I bonded, my friend. We united. And now Johnson is defeated. Uh -huh. See? We are quick, <laughs> to the point, in, out, bing, bang, boom. We're, we're gone. You guys are just making me too, it's making it too easy for me. <laughs> We do our best to help our clients feel comfortable. And, and, oh, and our, yeah, our yeah, clients. Yeah. All right, well, yeah. let's, let's go back to the prospecting around uh, listings. So tell me a little bit about You said you're spending four hours a day on that I side am. of things. Are, 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 are you just loading up a triple line dialer and, and, and dialing yeah. away at, at a radius? What are you doing? No, I'm just, uh, you know, I, I, I'm sorry to say I'm an old school guy. And I, just, I just call him. Yeah, you mean using what, what Greg calls the nugget, the, the, the finger, the digit. Um, so when you say you're calling, but you're still doing like a radius around the uh, the property, right? And um, so you're just picking, you're just pulling numbers, basically just picking up the phone, hand dialing instead of a triple line dialer, whereas Greg might do that. Correct. I, I'm not I'm not smart enough to do that. <laughs> I'm just not. I'm gonna buy that for one second. <laughs> I was gonna say, now, are, you, are you pulling like a full-on Jeff Quentin, where you've got like two headset, like a headset on each ear, and you got like phones in each hand, or what? I think, I think, I think Jeff, Jeff's got two dicks. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. You know <laughs> I don't know, man. Yes. That might be the best quote of the entire podcast. Here. <laughs> not, not in this episode, just the entire podcast we've done. Oh, that is awesome. Oh, that's funny. Oh man. <laughs> As you say this, I I got a notification on here that James Festini is is live right now, and he's I see him with two headsets on. I'm like, wait, are you guys talking about James? Are you guys seeing him right now too? Uh, for, for, first of all, I've known I've known Jeff for gosh over 20 years. All these guys I've known, we all grew up in the same trenches. They're all I love these guys to death. They're all phenomenal, phenomenal, powerful people, and uh, mm -hmm. it's been my privilege to know all these guys. They're great. It's the it yeah. is the truth. I mean, the guys and gals like you and my father and a bunch of the other guys, you know, and gals we've had on, the people that hustle and grind, put their nose to the grindstone, don't look up to kind of see what the, the other guy's doing to them next door, but they stick to their plan and they execute. You're going to be able, to, you're going to see a lot of people fall off, like 80 plus percent of the people are going to fall off the wayside. They're never going to come back, never heard from again. But you, those of you that stay true to the course, stay true to your plan and execute, you will build a bond, a brotherhood, and a sisterhood with those folks because you guys will tra trade war stories with each other, and then you can send a referral down to so-and-so in such-and-such -such town or anywhere USA because you're like, hey, look, I know a 4,000%. Bob over here is the great, best freaking guy in all of that town. You got to go call him right now. And with your authority and your voice, people yeah. are just like, okay, all right. It's, yeah, it, it's, just, it's, just, it's, just, it's, a very, it's a very, very, very simple business. It's just not easy. No. It's not easy. It is not yeah. easy at all. But, but, but it's very, very simple, you know, yeah. and, and you really have to get that if you understand how simple it is. But that it's not easy. But if you if you really are motivated, and you have goals and you have accountability and you're in a mastermind group um, and you're really going for it, then despite the fact that it is a tough business, if you keep it simple, that'll get you through the days that are, that are hard. It, it, Go ahead, Matt. What are you well, saying? I wanted to go in a little bit of a new direction and talk about daily schedules. So before we, we get to that, Greg, what, what have you got? Oh, I was just going to say that, that it's, it's one of the things that I've been preaching for a while, Michael, is the fact that it, this business is very, very simple. It's just not easy at all. And the easy part is what the, the average person is dying for because they look at HGTV. They look at the, the dumb shit Kardashians. Everything seems just to flow to those people on these channels when in reality, none of it's real. It's all completely fake. When I mean, they don't see, you know, they see the top agents like yourself. They see how you, they, it appears as, as if you're gliding through the air. 
but they didn't see the years of you in the trenches grinding it out, doing the unfun, unsexy, unseen things that they don't want to do. Therefore, they complain about not having the success that you do. But then when they get told what to do, they're like, ah, nope, I got to go. I got like, uh, I got a thing in a place like right now. And you're like, well, well then you're missing that's, out. that's enter, enter the complication, right? So the complication comes from running away from these simple but difficult things. Mm -hmm. All, all you know, the hand sure. marrying over over what technology do I use? What you know? What triple line dollar is the best? What CRM do you use? Where do you get your data? Like it's they're valid questions once you're doing it. But if mm -hmm. you you know so many people want to know all that stuff before they even pick up the phone and call once. Uh, it's more important to get into action. And, and Michael, that's where you come from. Is you're trained get into action, figure out the rest of it as you go along. There's something that I I was taught a long time ago probably before the two of you were born, which is that it's what you do in private and sometimes in the dark, come on, no comments now. <laughs> come on. <laughs> yeah, I know. That 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 you'll get um, accolades in public later. Mm -hmm. And it's really it's really the grind. You have mm. to really understand the grind. And it is what you do in private on those literally those hours, those days, those weeks, those years, and in my case those decades that um will 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 pay off but when you're uncomfortable and when you're sweating and when you're having some sleepless nights and you're you know um it's the people that don't stop and that stay persistent those are the ones that are going to win it's the ones mm -hmm. that give up unfortunately the 95 percent that give up unfortunately they should again they should be really not in this they should be doing a regular job somewhere they're not they're not cut out for this business. This business is, if you're going to excel at it, it takes a very odd person to really excel at this kind of business. I'm not going to take <laughs> that personally. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> well, I, well I, 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 you know, I'm a sick, I, mean, I, 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 you know, I'm a very strange individual, so I admit that. I know that. The, people that the people that know me best know how screwed up I am, but. Um, uh, <laughs> But it is true, though. I mean, you, you exactly. have to be—you have to be excited for failure. You have to be—you have to be—you have to be 100% comfortable with being told no. Go fuck yourself. You know, I'm never using you. Then your best friend goes uses someone, another agent. You got to have alligator tut thick skin. And when you have that, and you're okay with it, and you expect it, and you take the 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 the, the power out of the word no, and you make it an impotent word in your own mindset, then it gives you the ability to power through it. But so many people are so soft skinned. They're like, oh my God, he just said no to me. Oh, my feelers are crushed forever. Oh, I need a spa day. You're like, God, yeah, you're, fuck up. Your, your goals, your goals have to be have to be bigger than your challenges. Mm -hmm. You know, if your if your goals are are bigger than your than than these little challenges that come up, then yeah, on the on the challenging days or the challenging moments, it's gonna hurt a little bit, but you're gonna take your your five minute you know little cry, and then you're gonna get up and move on. Yeah. A lot of people let it, let it, they let it, you know, resonate inside of them and ferment into something that's much worse than it should have been. When you need to literally brush yourself off, I have people that are very close to me that take it very, very personally when they don't get a listing or they don't get, they aren't able to work with a buyer, their contract doesn't get accepted. I'm like you, my God, it, it just falls right off of me. Like, all right, whatever, move yeah, on the key, to the next one. The, the key word is next. Next, 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 next. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. You know, Terry always says, uh, he always, he's always says, there's always another boxcar coming down the track. <laughs> and, I, and I'm like, there is always another boxcar, but people get so caught up in the woods focusing at the trees, they can't see the forest. Well, that's when it gets back to if you, if you, if you generate, you don't have to tolerate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, we, me and Greg marvel about it all the time. Um, the the infighting, backbiting, and various other maladies that you can attribute to uh, the real estate agents that are just outside your door, Greg, and I'm sure you can say the same, Michael. Um, almost always, 99% of it comes down to being super protective of somebody because they don't have enough else going on. Mm -hmm. I never, you know, I never deal with agents. Thank God, good for you. Lucky man, <laughs> yeah, I knuckles I, to you. <laughs> no, 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 I, and I don't mean that as, as a sense of pride, it's just that, that that's, not my, that's not my job. Mm. True. My job is to take the listing and get it sold. That's it. It's not to talk to a bunch of agents. 
What would, <laughs> what would your be advice, Michael? What would your be advice to a new agent when it comes to all the bickering, backstabbing in the office? Where would you go? I mean, because a lot of agents get sucked into this this the typhoon of horseshit out in the office with like back, you know, you know, back, stabbing each other. I, in the I, back. I, I I would work from home. I would never come in the office. Well when said. I first, when I first started in the business. Um, First, I worked in the bullpen, and then I started selling a lot of properties. So they, I asked them to give me a private office um, because I was generating a lot of business. And they did, um, but then the other agents started getting resentful about it. And, you know, I just – I never paid attention to that stuff. I One guy tried to get actually violent with me because huh? I, was, I was walking in his, in his farm – <laughs> no. I said, now this is this is like 1991. Um, I said, what's a farm? He goes, well, you know, it's a protected area. I said, what do you mean? What, I said, what do you mean a protected area? Um, he said, well, that's my area. I said, where's your contract? <laughs> he said, I don't have a contract. I said, well, are we in Cuba? I mean, what are you what are you talking about? Protected area? If you if you own this area, how come I'm sitting there knocking on doors? By the way. I was knocking on doors at 8.30 this morning. What were you doing? <laughs> Punked them. Right? <laughs> so, you know, I just, again, I, I find the easiest way to deal with those kind of things, if somebody gets in my face, is just start asking them questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's no reason to even I just ask questions. And then they'll get so mad that they'll either hit you or they'll just walk away. <laughs> <laughs> it's a I very like good this. way to end, end, the, end the career. And, either, and either, either way is okay, but, you know, I, but... <laughs> But in all, in all seriousness, I, if I was a new agent today, and that's the reason why I, I, I went out on my own so, so quickly because I couldn't take the politics. I, I, mm -hmm. I was with a, a company, I won't mention the name, but it starts with a C and ends with a B. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's a mystery. I don't know who you talk about. <laughs> I know. It's a, it's a mystery. Um, Kaufman Brothers. Um, that's, yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was generating a lot of business, and they weren't giving me any referrals. And I finally got really mad at it, mad at them because they started pressuring me about advertising. I said, let me ask you a question. I'll, I'll, everything aside, why aren't you giving me referrals? They said, because we don't make any money off you. Hmm? I said, what do you mean you don't make any money off me? They said, well, you, you're on an 85-15 split. I said, yeah, so? They said, well, all these other people are on 50-50 splits. I said, I, you still lost me. I said, explain to me this business. I said, well, let, let, let's explain to you so you understand. At the time I was doing I think, like 40 or 50 deals a year, they say, you know, 40, 50 deals at a 15% split, we don't make money off you. But the guy sitting next to you doing six deals a year on a 50-50 split, we make money on him. Plus, we don't have to deal with his BS of people calling in, who's this Michael Young guy? He's calling me at 7.30 in the morning and all the you know, stuff <laughs> to deal with you, paying, paying the butt that you are. And, and as soon as I really understood what they were talking about, I actually thanked them. Mm -hmm. I set a plan in my head 90 days later to open my own, my own office. And I was gone within 90 days because I didn't want to deal with the, that negative, small thinking around me. So sorry about all, all the long stories, but I would never come in. I would only come in for you know group meetings or whatever it is. Other than that, I would I would have a home office. I would never come in the office. You that, know. that that whole that whole that brick and mortar whole model is dead. Yes, I completely agree with you. And this, for all of you guys on iTunes, I'm going to show that is my door. Guys, that is always closed. That is, you know, it, unless someone's going in and out of it, it's closed because, Michael, I'm like you. I can't take the bullshit out there. I cannot take the infighting. I can't take the politics. I really can't take the politics of who's doing what to whom and can't believe that. It's like, dude, I'm not here to talk about that with you. I'm here to make money. I'm here to make new real estate. End of story. And I think that you were, you, you, them having the courage to work from home, even if their manager is like, come on in and be around the environment, what, what if the environment's toxic? Yeah. Then what's well, that, well, that it's not. It's not. It's not. What if the environment's toxic? The environment okay. is toxic, because mm -hmm. if, I mean, let's let's think it through. If you have 30 agents, and we take percentages of what normal companies run at, only three to five percent of all the agents in the office are doing a business. So, if you have 30 agents and only five percent of the agents are are doing any business, how many agents is that? Right. <laughs> so yeah. that that means that that means that the other what. 25 agents or whatever it is are knuckleheads mm -hmm. and you don't want to, you don't want to be around small thinking knuckleheads. No, no. You want to, you, you have to look again, if you're going to be in this business, you have to control your environment. 
you have to control what goes in here, what goes in here, and, and that way when it comes out, it comes out the way you want it to because if you can't control those two things, you're going you're gonna to get sucked in. You, you, know, can't, you can't, can't afford to do that. Yeah. You know, it's something I've told a lot of people, Michael, is this, is that, you know, if, if people want to get advice and they want to talk to a local agent that, 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 you know, how to do business in their local marketplace, and they're like, well, should I just talk to Bob next door to me? I'm like, no, do not talk to Bob next door to you. You go to the best agent in the area or in your brokerage and you ask them to take them out for coffee or you take or, or you bring them coffee or you do something and borrow five to ten minutes of your time. I know that you would probably give them five to 10 minutes of time if they were proactive. They said, okay, Michael, how do I become successful in Marin County? You say, I have, this. I have, agents, I have agents shadow me all the time. Exactly. And you don't, you're not thre threatened by it at all. And you tell them the truth. But if they're an asshole and they don't do what the, you told them to do, you're like, okay, I don't have time for you. But if they come back and they're like, Michael, you told me to do this. I did that. Here are my results. You'd be like, okay, you're awesome. Let's go. Cause I mean, you know, it's really up to them. I mean, you look, come in, you want to watch your work, watch your work. You're not going to do it anyway, so you're no threat to me. <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to, you're not going to, you're not going to get up at 4:30 in the morning and be here by 7:15, and you've already worked out and, and done, written your goals, and you know, meditated and had a good breakfast, and you're fully oxygenated because you worked out, and you're going to get on the phones by 7:15. You're going to give your assistant your, the phone so you don't screw up on that. You're not going to prospect for four hours and then have a meeting you know, at 11 a.m. and then take lunch and then come back and prospect some more and go on appointments and pre-qualify. And you're not going to do one-tenth of that. Nope. So nope. I, I don't care. What do I care? <laughs> you know, the thing, the thing is it's so sad, Michael, we were talking about in the beginning. By, by the way, by the way, excuse me, no judgment. I, I know it sounds really judgy and really – I didn't mean it that way. You have to be a lunatic to do that stuff. You cannot be a normal person and do that kind of stuff. It's no, not, it, that's not a normal. That, that is not a mm -hmm. normal way of living. Well, we pre-qualified to the fact that you and I are both already nuts. So you know, it's it's, it's not, and we're not judging. Certifiable. We, we chose, yeah, we're certifiable. It, it, we're it is what it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, but the fact is, is that that's that is the mentality, and that's the cool part about it is that that's the hustle and grind. You are you're like, hey, new agent, here's the blueprint. Literally follow it, carbon copy this thing, and you will have this success. They're that's like. It. I can't get up anywhere before six and I have to leave by three. You're like, well, all right, well, you just, you just got enough, okay. you yourself enough rope, rope to hang yourself, knock yourself out, that, cowgirl. That, that's okay. And, it, and by the way, if they want to do, you know, two to five to 10 deals a year, great, wonderful. I'll take mm -hmm. the rest. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> no. No well, let's, let's talk about your big why, Michael, because this is really interesting to me, which is, the funneling the the funds and, and this cash flow essentially from real estate the the sales side into the investing side. So you have a very big why in terms of why after 20 some years in the business why you still get up at 4:30 in the morning and why you're on the phones at 7:15. So let, let's share go into that a little bit for us so that people get a sense of why you still do this. Well, the reason why I got into real estate brokerage is because I found that it was probably the, one of the best engines I could have to. Um, build an asset base of passive income. Okay. And so that, that is, that's my, my definite major purpose is to, is to have a certain amount of passive income every month and to keep that growing and to keep building my asset base. So all profits mm -hmm. after paying taxes and expenses and regular, you know, living, uh, you know, living money, uh, goes into investing into real estate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And has for sure. more than 20 years now. And and what are your favorite, like when you look for deals, I don't know, are you looking for things that you run across in the normal course of your real estate business? Do you have other people out there looking for? And, and like what types of deals do you look for that really fit your style and your plan? Well, I have a very, very, very simple philosophy when it comes to buying property, which is to buy it, fix it, and hold it. Hmm. Okay. So I'm only, I'm only, I'm not looking at cap rates. I'm not looking at IRRs, you know, internal rate of returns, that, that is all irrelevant to me. I'm looking for what is the upside. I'm looking for value-add properties. I'm looking for mismanaged, um, misallocated uh, properties where the seller is in trouble of some kind or doesn't want to be in that business anymore or maybe has a drug or alcohol problem. Maybe they died. Maybe mm. they're being divorced. Um, you know, yeah. the typical – I'm not looking for trophy properties where I'm going to get, you know, 5%, 6% cap. That – with no upside, I'm going to pray that it, that it goes up 5, 10, 20, 50% in the next 10 years. That, that, I have no interest in that. 
I yeah. want pro problem properties that I can raise the rents after I fix them up 30, 40 percent hmm. uh, and, and just hold them forever. Nice. Yeah, that is, that is a, that's one of the, the, the ways I look at investments and the same kind of mentality. I want to, when I start buying again, after I lost everything in 08, um, and is it buy, hold, buy, fix, hold, and then just keep it forever. And I don't, I don't, I don't really care. I don't, I don't need a, a class, you know, triple A, you know, grade A commercial building as my investment property. I don't, I don't care. It can be in well, a dog so, gun neighborhood. I well, don't it's interesting care. what you said about trophy property, right? So it, you're saying trophy in the sense of, something that you're proud to have your name attached to that, you, that comes up at a cocktail party like oh you own that bill is that is that kind of what you're talking about an ego driven or letting ego into your investments well, right yeah so i mean I, the people that i always have admired that I've, I've studied over the years would be people like sam zell okay. um you know if 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 you take his philosophy in stocks and apply it to real estate warren buffett mm -hmm. these are people that are looking for value that other people either don't see or know that there's going to be work involved and they're going to shy away from. Mm. So, you know, the Sam Zells, the Lurries, the Shorensteins, the, um, the Steve Wins, the Donald Trumps, all these people um, are risk takers. But the difference is, is that I never have gotten highly leveraged. Um, I am leveraged, but only to the extent that I'm um, using OPM, other people's money. Mm -hmm. But the litmus test for me is if I'm looking at a property, I know that we're going to have another recession sometime. I don't know how deep it will be. Sometime we'll have another one. We always do it's normal, which is a great buying opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, if it if it can't cash flow after it takes a 20% hit in, in rents, I won't buy it. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean break even. I mean it has to still, still cash flow. Still cash flow after all expenses, management, taxes, everything. It has to still cash flow positive. Even after a 20 to 30 percent drop in rents, or I won't buy it. So, is it for an, an important distinction? Is it the rents that you buy it at, or the rents that you renovate and then re rent it at? Re rent it at. I'm only looking at value add properties. Do you okay. know what I mean when I say value add? Very much so. Absolutely. Will, will, the audience, will the audience understand when I say value add? Well, might as well explain it to them. All right. So, so I'm, I'm only looking for properties that have upside. I'm looking for the properties that are blighted. I'm looking now. Good neighborhoods, not not ghetto neighborhoods. Hmm. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for um, blue to white white collar neighborhoods. Not necessarily white neighborhoods, but but you know white, white collar, collar neighborhoods. White, white yeah. Collar, yeah. I don't care what what, what race. Yeah. Um, and so decent, hardworking, working, pride of ownership neighborhoods. But it's that property in the corner that God nobody seems to touch. It's been like that for 50 or 60 years. And I'm going to come in and we're going to gut it and redo it and uh make it beautiful and that rent's going to jump from nine hundred dollars a month to fourteen hundred dollars a month per unit beautiful so in terms of like balancing this with your real estate career and your business so when do you obviously you know you, you make time for the things that are important so I don't, is, is it something that you kind of shoehorn in and around your standard schedule do you carve out time to you know review deals look at your homes that are kind of in renovation and things like that you have to, is it built you in? Have, yeah, you have to. First of all, I don't, I don't own any single family homes, so so these are all multi residential unit properties. Mm -hmm. um, you have to decide early in your career how much time you're willing to spend on building your assets. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I would suggest probably the first three to five years, if you're a new agent, you're probably going to spend no more than maybe five percent because you've really got to you really got to get that engine going. Once that engine is going with its three, five, seven years, then you can start spending. Now, when I say three to five percent, we're not talking about an eight-hour day. So let's let's drop this this balance thing right out the window. If you're looking for a balanced <laughs> eight-hour day, now you know. By the way, I'm 27 years old. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I see how long it would take for you to get that. Um, <laughs> Uh, if you're if you're looking if you're looking for balance and you're looking to be wealthy and that's a big word by the way it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people then what I'm going to say is not going to make any sense. But at the age of 54 and being in the business now as long as I've been to it, probably 30 to 40 percent of my day now is spent. Besides what I do in my regular real estate brokerage career, is in um, 
the building of my assets, my asset mm -hmm. base, acquisition uh, and development of property. I'm not well, saying everybody should do that, but I work, I'll be honest with you, I work 10 to 12 hours a day, mm -hmm. probably five, five and a half days a week. And anywhere from 20 to 40% of those days are spent in acquisition, uh, negotiation and management mode of, of my properties. Now, I don't manage any of my properties myself, but, um, you know, it, it takes time. It takes effort. It does. But you've, yeah. you've built up the ability to do that. You have your team surrounding you. You're the heart surgeon that comes in. They glove you. You do your surgery. You're gone. When it comes to right. real estate, it frees up the rest right. of your day. That's right. And, you know, for, for an agent when they're first starting out, I mean, what, I've heard of the five property theory. So, you know, you, that five is where you, is, is your magical number. So you buy the first, you take no, you take no profits home, you put everything back and you pay that mortgage down as fast as possible. Once you can get some cash and you buy a second one, then you take the profits from the second one, you take the, you, you break even on that and you take the proceeds and you dump it into the first until you pay the first one completely debt free. And you build, you go this way until five and then all of them are just nonstop cash flowing to you. Or do you yeah, want to keep I, a debt service on them for your Yeah, cash? I don't, I think that that's an old, that's an outdated theory. Okay. I think you have to the, the you, you have to understand that there are different levels of financial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Now, now, I didn't graduate. I barely graduated high school, so you have to understand there's different types of intelligence. Um, a average investor will do something like that, and anybody could do that. Mm -hmm. This the superior investor understands that debt is like a gun. It can be used to protect you, right. or it can be used to kill you. If you're smart, you will use debt. Uh, in, in the right way so that you will you'll increase your wealth now money is almost free right now yeah. so people that are paying off mortgages i think now one man's opinion don't get mad i think are, are not being real bright now is the time to use debt uh manageable debt you know 20 30 mm percent -hmm. down minimum mm -hmm. to, to increase your wealth and, but you know if you can't sleep at night if you have debt then obviously what i'm saying won't make any sense but You've got to be able to understand that it's not what you sell for, it's what you buy it for. You have to be able to, you have to have a superior financial IQ to be able to do these things. And to do that, you better do your homework and you better model people and you better do it right or else you, you're going to get in trouble. But to not use debt now is a major, major mistake. What are, what are top three things that you would lever? Why, why do you want debt? Give me a couple of reasons. I mean, taxes. I mean, what, what, what are some other, you know, for, for write offs? I mean, what are a couple of ways that people would, can leverage that debt? Well, you just said two reasons, but the most important reason is that if you, if you use debt, um, you're going to have, besides natural appreciation, if you're able to hold the property for five or 10 or 15 years, um, then that debt is going to be able to pyramid you into bigger and bigger properties. Mm -hmm. You're going to be able to become wealthier faster if you do that if you do it you know the way where you pay it off every i mean that's fine but to me that's just that's far too conservative but again that's one man's opinion i, I i've always used debt i've never lost a property i've never had my um my uh my debt um sorry guys late in the day it's, my, it's uh, okay. my, FI, my fico score has never been less than like between 750 and 800 so you know you just have to be smart about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's what I was saying. Hey. For the, the people are going to graduate into where you are mentally, because you're you're a mental giant in, in investing in, in real estate. The, the layman, that's what I was talking about. The five properties. So get five of them, and then they can learn. They can, they'll graduate to where you are absolutely with the. I I, I, I did with I, I see it a little differently. I'm not I'm not with all due respect. I think that you have to start learning about debt immediately. So start small. Buy a little condo or a little house. Get some debt on it. Make sure it's manageable so that you, you start taking on bigger and bigger properties, but you always keep your debt manageable because if you can't learn about debt when you first start, then you're never going to learn about it. Mm -hmm. I'd rather see you make a mistake early and learn from it than have five properties are paid off. Then you get into a big property. You screw it up because you never learned about debt. It'd be like, it'd be like, you know, taking, giving a, giving a 10 year old a gun. Never having real, real bullets in it. And then you, when they're 20, say, okay, I know you don't know anything about guns, but here now it's a full live gun. I've never really taught you about it. And then they, they blow their head off. It's the <laughs> same thing. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, you have to learn when you first start, but you be very, very conservative and cautious because again, it can be dangerous or it can be a, a great tool. It's, it all depends on how you use it.
Hmm. So basically, okay. it just it just become better than of who you are. You know, be, become smarter. Get that two percent increase of your knowledge. That's don't fabulous. don't don't jump in and buy a a fifty plex. Buy a no, duplex. no. Start small and, exactly. and learn learn from the best. Mm. Model somebody. Have somebody mentor you on it. Um, find the wealthiest one or two or three real estate people in your community. Take them to lunch. Ask them to mentor you. Can I hang around you? I'll work for you for free. Whatever it takes. I want to mm. learn from you. I'm not. Gonna, I, I don't have the money to compete with you. Just let me hang around with you. Let me learn how you think. Let me learn how you act. Let me learn how you put deals together. Let me learn how you tie things up and you juggle all these different things because, again, you're learning financial intelligence. You're not learning academic intelligence. You're not learning, learning emotional intelligence. You're learning financial intelligence. And at the end of the day, that's all we're talking about. That's all that matters in the scoreboard we're talking about. No, that's now. What would you say if you said, like, hey, Michael, I don't have the money to compete with you, but I'm a great bird dog. Would you ever consider partnering with me? Exactly. So, I mean, I, I, see, uh, for, see, that's in that. Perfect example. Um, I don't have the money to compete with you. Can I can I prospect for you an hour or two a day? And tell me what kind of deals you're looking for. And mm -hmm. If I bring them to you, you don't even have to pay me a commission. Just let me be involved in the deal and watch how you do it from start to finish. Now, who's going to say no to that? Yeah, give them a small but, equity stance nobody. and let me learn. Exactly. Yeah, don't but, don't take a thing. Just offer offer total service and the only thing you want is exposure and mm -hmm. to learn mm -hmm. you will learn more that way than any book any anything you possibly imagine yeah matt and i are bringing out a new product and that's one of the parts that we're talking about is to go to the best of the best shadow them and do everything that they say to do learn from them because now, now down the road when you become better and smarter and bigger you guys could you know you know, JV together on a larger project, and the the uh, mentor could feel comfortable with the mentee Absolutely. that they're intelligent Absolutely. because they taught them. They ta they trained them. They yeah. know how they think. They know how they act. They know how they move. They know how they zig they zag. Absolutely. Hmm. That, so, a no, no, that you you won't <laughs> succeed by doing that. So all of you guys that are sitting out there, that are sitting in the corner, being a bunch of pussies and not actually di dipping your big toe into the pool. Listen to what Michael's saying. The guy is uber successful, and he's literally saying, "Come sit at my feet." I will, I will, I, I will give you the knowledge that you desire, but you have to take the action to ask, and be willing to learn, and be willing to open up, you know, show your underbelly, show the part that you don't know, mm -hmm. and allow yourself to get better. But that ego gets in the way, and it doesn't allow yes. people to get better. Yeah, I mean, it's so uh, a friend of mine, Jeff Cohn, who's who, uh, he was on the show here just a couple of weeks ago, talking about a guy that he's sold. I mean, he makes over a million dollars a year from his residential team, and he's doing the same thing. He's calling up, you know, the Matt Aitchisons of the world, you know, the David Osborns of the world, the guys that are big in the investing game that that are kind of in his circle and saying, look, like, you know, teach me. Like, I know nothing. Um, he's got a flipping company. He's got, you know, buying a whole company, all this other stuff, but he's just getting into that, and he's having to go through that same process. You humble yourself, and you find who is doing it the best who is in my network that I can reach out to um, and you yeah you humble yourself and ask for help and you ask for you know something you look for some way that you can obviously you know exchange services and things like that or, or offers them something of value but yeah it's it's we let our ego get in the way way too much and really unsuccessful people let their ego get in the way a lot more than the people that actually have an ego to protect and something that they've done in their life that, that is significant, which is always surprising and funny to me. The people that you meet that are the most successful are usually the ones that are, um, they have an ego, but they're able to subject it and still go learn from the best. All we're talking about, whether it's brokerage or learning from someone uh, on how to build assets, is to offer your own service mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and to be open and to be open to everything. and um, Without any ego, if you mm. do that, whether it's whether it's listing a house or learning how to buy property, you're, you're, you there's there's no way you're not going to be massively successful. There's just no mm. way. Look at the top producers in your areas, guys. When you when you go to conferences with them, or if there's a speaker in in in, in the office, guaranteed the top top producers are going to have a notepad. They'll be the ones taking the notes. They'll be the ones raising the hands because they never. They, they, they don't care about their ego. They're like, hey, well, that's a great new product or new technique. How does that work? Explain it more to me. Help me understand, you know, blah, blah, blah. You've got to do that. I mean, Michael, you actually execute. Yeah, then, uh, that, yeah. Then actually execute. Imagine that.
<laughs> All right. Well, in the last couple of minutes we have left, uh, Michael, share kind of the areas that you really specialize in where if somebody has a referral in your area where they where you would like them to keep you in mind. Well, I work the entire San Francisco Bay Area. So anywhere in San Francisco, Marin County, Oakland, Alameda area, Silicon Valley, um, Contra Costa, Sonoma hey. County. Sonoma County. Um, <laughs> you're, you're drifting dangerously into great Them's territory. fighting words. Can, can, I, can, I tell, can I tell you the great news? Um, we, we should actually be referring people to each other because there's some yeah, people sure. that you and I are not going to connect with. And mm -hmm. I'll pay you 25%. You pay me 25%. Actually, uh, if I have actually my best friend and his fiance. If they're not working with the agent, they're buying in Marin. So I'll see if they're still working with that with whoever they're working with. And if they're not, I'll shoot them up to you for sure. There it is and vice versa. Bing, bang, boom. <laughs> and then, uh, Michael, what's the best, uh, the best way to connect with you? So obviously Greg knows your email, but uh, everybody else doesn't. So would you like to direct them to a certain website or a phone number? Sure. Yeah, no, that's great. So my phone number, my cell phone number is 415-215-3925. And, and the uh, website is Princeton Pacific Properties. Perfect. PrincetonPacificProperties.com. All right. That's it. Awesome. Well, this has been uh, one of my favorite conversations, mm -hmm. Greg. This has been fantastic. Um, yes. I know we have to wrap things up. So real quick, guys, we've got the new course that's launching next week. It is a four-week live training class called Get Now Business, and it's designed to help you strategically go after the quadrant of people that are the most likely to do business with you in the shortest period of time. So that's the people that have one of two things or both, which is A, a relationship of some kind or a connection with you, and B, a need, and how exactly to find them. Greg, you briefly mentioned that one of the things that we have in there is partnerships, uh, you know, joint ventures with agents that might have leads. There's all kinds of ideas in there for that. We also talk about how to strategically go after the people that you already have some sort of mutual connection or relationship with um, and look for the people within that network that have a need for what you do and how to get authentic, really good referrals so that you have a business like Michael's that runs a lot on your relationships, so a no complications business. So that, uh, that class launches on May 8th. That is Monday, guys. So you've got until then to sign up. Go to getnowbusiness.com. And then, uh, Greg, anything you want to leave us off with before we sign up? Yes, guys. I put the link into the chat here on Facebook. If you guys are watching this live or watching this on the replay, please click on the link. Watch Matt and I talk about the, sh uh, the, the live class. Well, it's not a product. It's a live class. Um, and we want to see you guys on Monday. But, guys, between now and then, please go follow me on Facebook. Please go follow Matt on Facebook. If you friend either of us, you will immediately be sent into purgatory. Um, <laughs> And, we'll, and we will throw away the key promptly. At least Matt will. Matt's going to swallow it. You're never going to see that key again. Um, but we, we love you guys. We do this show because we, because we love you guys. We want to see you succeed. It's ethically awesome when I get a conversation or hit up on Facebook or anything else like that going, hey, Greg, this is what you told me. This is what I did. These are my results. That is my greatest reward on planet Earth. Matt and I have always done this, you know, for free for you guys. People have asked us to coach them at 500 to 750 bucks a, a, a month. We have turned them down flatly because that is the institution that people have been, you know, be beaten over the head with for too long. The people that can't afford it are the people that we want to serve. So if there's someone else out there that you know that should be listening to us, please do us a huge favor. Do them a huge favor. Spread the word about our show so we can have a powerful impact on more, more people's lives and their families so they can live the lives of their dreams. So with that being said, follow us, guys. Go, go. If you guys want to learn how to do investing, Michael gave you his phone number. I bet your asses won't call him, though. I bet it's you. I see you right there. That's you. I'm talking to you. All right. We're out of here, Johnson. What do you say? Sounds good. All right. Peace out, ninjas. We gone.